The transgender debate has seeped into every corner of the mainstream media as trans activists are pitted against radical feminists in an interminable war of birth that leaves most of polite society caught somewhere in the crossfire. However, one of the few beliefs that is widely shared on both sides of the divide is that gender and sex are mutually exclusive concepts. As Simone de Beauvoir, one of the most prominent thinkers on gender, wrote, one is not born a woman, one becomes one. Indeed, the World Health Organization defines gender as a social construct, referring to a range of socially constructed roles, behaviors, expressions, and identities. Although paradoxically, gender identity may also refer to how individuals feel in relation to their sex and whether they feel as if they were born in the right body. Sex, however, refers to a set of biological characteristics associated with physical and physiological features, including the individual's chromosomes, their gene expression, their hormone levels, and their reproductive anatomy. However, the question remains, if gender is simply a social construct, then why are record numbers of trans individuals undertaking corrective surgeries and injecting themselves with hormones to augment their sexual and physical characteristics? As the American Society of Plastic Surgeons know, surgeons are now performing record numbers of mastectomies on trans individuals and a record number of gender-affirming surgeries overall. Moreover, we are now witnessing a record number of referrals to the gender identity Identity Development Service, which provides, among other things, an array of gender-affirming physical therapies, including the administering puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. In light of this paradox, if we accept that gender is a social construct, and specifically that gender and sex are different mutually exclusive concepts, gender refers to socially constructed roles, behaviours, expressions, identities of individuals, while sex refers to a set of biological attributes, primarily associated with physical and physiological features, including chromosomes, gene expression, hormone levels and their function, and our sexual reproductive anatomy. Therefore, transitioning gender entails exchanging one set of gender norms, stereotypes, behaviours and expressions for another. If transitioning is a matter of socially transitioning from one set of norms and expressions to another, then why do record numbers of transitioners augment their physiological and sexual characteristics? In conclusion, I argue that what we are seeing is a conflation of the terms sex and gender, as individuals pursue physiological treatments to what is seemingly a social problem, resulting in an increasing number of people concluding that if they identify with the stereotypes of their opposite gender, they must be in the wrong body. Instead, if we are asserting that gender is a fluctuating social construct, then we should prescribe social treatments like talking therapies, socially transitioning, or perhaps even abandoning the idea that there are any fixed genders to transition from or to. One could object to premise four and say that changing one's physiology is a necessary evil in order to more easily pass or present as their identified gender, enabling them to draw less attention and stigma than would have otherwise been the case. For these individuals, it may simply be a case of trying to live a more trouble-free life than would otherwise have been the case. However, I think it's clear to see that many individuals, and especially children and teenagers, simply confuse and conflate these two concepts. In one documentary, we see a six-year-old trans girl illustrate the conceptual confusion that merely identifying with one gender norm or gender role, or in this case, merely identifying with all of the trappings of being a girl makes us a girl. And we see the link that merely identifying with wearing girl's clothing must entail that one was born in the wrong body. I really didn't want to be a boy. I feel like I'm in the wrong body. Now I'm living as a girl, I feel much um, better. Why, did you, why were you so sure you would be happier wearing girls' clothes? Because I sort of am a girl. I like girl stuff. And can you remember what you were thinking or what you felt like when you were wearing boys' clothes when you were younger? Mm, I was a bit cross and sad. When, it, when I started wearing girls' clothes to school, um, I felt much better. Mm. I have girl trousers, a girl cardigan, a girl top and girl shoes. 
I just didn't feel right in who I was. I really thought though, am I in the right body? The first time I realized was when she wanted to go out. I want to wear a skirt and I want to wear a, a frilly top. And I want you to call me her. her. As we see in these examples, there is reason to believe that there is an increasingly widespread inflation of the terms sex and gender. Therefore, I argue that according to the prevailing notion among the LGBT community that gender is a social construct, that it is unethical to promote irreversible physical treatments for a problem that is, according to the literature, mostly if not entirely social in nature. Therefore, to the extent that we would wish individuals to make informed decisions regarding what therapeutic approaches to undertake, we cannot recommend or often irreversible physical interventions for a problem that is mostly if not entirely social in nature and that is often the result of psychological turmoil and confusion. Indeed, the most common age of individuals referred to kids is between 13 to 16 years old. Additionally, according to the NHS clinical commissioning policy, between 22 and 44% of trans individuals also suffer from comorbid depression and anxiety. And as the sex researcher Deborah So remarks, there is a significant correlation between gender dysphoria, both autism and homosexuality. What we see in these cases are individuals that feel uncomfortable and even confused about themselves, the world and their place in it for various reasons, whether that may be going through puberty or suffering from a mental health disorder. What we are seeing are individuals now being increasingly told that if they feel uncomfortable with themselves, that they may be suffering from gender dysphoria and that physical interventions may be needed to alleviate their turmoil. Furthermore, it is also important that we accept that this is a category error to assume that one can change their gender identity through physiological means, as it would be if we asserted that one can any meaningful way change their political identity through physiological means. Indeed, if gender is a social construct, there is no physiological basis to this identity. Instead, what constitutes these identities is our outward expressions, behaviours, and the sense that we identify with such social construct. In the case of exchanging our political identities, there can be no physiological interventions, but rather we substitute one banner for another, we substitute the ideals of one political identity for another, and we vote for one party over another. And moreover, to the extent that individuals feel the need to cover up their perceived flaws, whether it be using chest binders to compress their breasts, or a leotard to compress their genitalia, or whether they feel as if they don't belong in their own body at all. We have to question the extent that gender dysphoria correlates with body dysmorphic disorder. A disorder where individuals may experience obsessive worries about one or more perceived flaws in their physical appearance. Flaws that often cannot be seen by others or appear very slight. Individuals may also develop compulsive behaviours and routines such as excessive use of mirrors or picking at their skin. Indeed, if you have an atypical feeling towards your gender, there are two approaches one can take. One can try and augment their sexual characteristics, which we cannot fully change in the hope of ameliorating their gender dysphoria. Or we can admit that a social problem requires a social solution, whether it entails undergoing various talking therapies, socially transitioning, or perhaps more logically and more radically, seeing that there are no fixed and static gender labels. If gender as a social construct fluctuates over time, then it is simply a matter of adopting the behaviours and expressions that resonate with us. Rather than trying to strictly divide all of our social behaviours into a never-ending number of boxes, rather, if there is nothing essential to each gender identity, what we need to do is to abolish the notion of gender and rather say that there are infinite numbers of ways to be in the world, while also accepting that we cannot fully replace all of our sexual characteristics for those of our opposite sex. Ultimately, if one is not born a woman but becomes one, then what is the sense in trying to assemble the body we wish we were born into? 
if you've liked this video and want to see more videos on how philosophy can help us study society, then please share, subscribe and like the video. Thank you.